Scarlet Knights fans, I'm your host, Larry K. Welcome to another episode and edition of Night Watch with Larry K. Um, just wanted to touch base uh, on the last game in Michigan, discuss it a little bit more in depth, and uh, get ready for Wagner. As we know, Rutgers goes down 31-7. to I think the game started off the way we would all like to see the game start off. Um, you have Gavin Wimsett throw a great pass and this time between the numbers right everybody's saying Gavin can only throw to the outside he struggles in the middle of the field that may be true he may be developing that part of his game he may be struggling to an extent Uh, but at the end of the day his best pass really the only time Rucker scored all game was Gavin's throw down the middle of the field Uh, just an excellent route and an excellent um, excellent way to to get it home uh, by Dremel uh, Dremel's been, you know, quite a revelation this year. I think there was some hesitancy and some speculation and a little bit of discomfort in the fan base when uh, he was being showcased and utilized so much in the spring. But you're seeing now, I mean, that Dremel, despite the way he came into the program, he has worked his way up and legitimately deserves to be where he is. And he's legitimately competing. Uh, on the field in the big house against Michigan. You know, one of the upper echelon Big Ten teams, not only traditionally, not only historically, but now. So, you know, this, and this kind of, I think, I think this Michigan game, look, it was close deep into the second half or deep enough into the second half. And the game really only got completely out of reach, I think we all felt, when we had that turnover on the fourth down that went for a pick six it was a very odd pick six wasn't the one you usually see out on the boundary where a corner jumps a route uh there was a lot of contact in there I don't love the play design at all especially given you know how far we had to go especially given what we like to claim as our team's identity Gavin had to do something with the ball you can't take a sack you can't go down you can't run into the teeth of that defense he throws it in there hoping somebody makes a play And the person who made the play, and it was, let's face it, a really nice play, was the Michigan defender, takes it all the way back. And I think that's the first time, you know, that the complexion of the game was really changed. Prior to that, I mean, you had Michigan. Michigan was pulling out some little fluky trick plays just to get a leg up on us, just to kind of put Rutgers on its heels a little bit. Because we start off the game... A few plays, and and Wimsett throws a, a beautiful dart to Dremel. He takes it to the house. We're up 7 nothing. We kick the ball off, and Michigan does not look like they're going to be able to move the ball at ease at all. Our defense forces a three and out. We get the ball back, and right off the bat, Kyle Manungai goes for like a 20-plus yard run, and we're near midfield. And all of a sudden, we get a holding call that you know I don't think was a was a good call at all. If you watch the tape, and I believe Mike Broadbent, you know, of the TKR podcast, uh, put up a video of it. Just doesn't look good at all. Does not look like there was an actual hold there. So rough call, um, and that thwarts our momentum a bit. And then Michigan kind of finds its groove with the help of some innovative play calling. And let's face it, with a quarterback. Uh, who's talented, especially when it comes to the read option, especially when it comes to using his legs. J.J. McCarthy, at the end of the day, 15 of 21 for 214 yards and one touchdown passing. Um, Rushing seven carries for 51 yards. It's a 7.3 average. But I didn't see McCarthy, and I didn't say, and mind you, this is a guy who's regarded as one of the better quarterbacks in college football. I didn't look at McCarthy and say, oh my God, you know, Gavin Wimsett is so, his floor and ceiling are so beneath McCarthy because he just doesn't have the physical tools. 
I didn't say that at all or see that at all. Uh, that doesn't mean Wimsett's ever going to get to the level of a McCarthy, but he has the physical attributes to do it if he continues to develop. Gavin Wimsett's day, uh, 11 of 21 for 180 yards, one touchdown, one interception. The interception is what it is. You can't take him away just like you can't add him on the ones earlier in the season where he threw some ill-advised passes and the guys couldn't come up with it. But I think it's a respectable outing on the ground. Uh, Wimsett carried six times for 28 yards. It's a 4.7 yard per carry average. I think you're starting to see, and I noticed it especially early on in the game on a few plays, I think you're starting to see Gavin make really good decisions or better decisions uh, as he's reading it and then handing the ball off or choosing to keep the ball. I think he's got more confidence in himself that he could run and he could get yards. And I think you're starting to see uh, how much that opens up an offense and how much that uh, continues to help an offense improve when you have a quarterback who's a legitimate threat with his legs and when teams are seeing that threat on film and seeing that threat in the game, it opens up the game uh, on a few levels quite a bit. Um, it opens up uh, passing lanes because they're they're emphasizing uh, more of our run game from multiple different looks and multiple different players. It opens up our running game, both for Gavin and then for whichever running backs in the game, because there's some hesitancy with guys looking to fill gaps or just keeping an eye on people um, or even how to read a blocker and, and where you're going after the guy. So um, I thought that Gavin, I mean, look, this is their first road game this year and it's in the big house against the number two team in the country, a team that's going to contend for the Big Ten title, a team that's going to contend and vie for uh, being top two, top one, top five in the country all year, a team that's season will be a disappointment if it doesn't go to the college football playoff. And, you know, they're going to have to contend with Penn State. Some other things are going to have to happen. But that is the first time this team this year has gone on the road and they went to the big house in Michigan. They lost handily, uh, but Michigan had to pull out some plays to beat them. And I think Gavin Wim said, especially you saw in the second half when he was throwing the ball because he was forced to throw the ball because we were behind. I mean, he and you watch the, the tape and Richie Schneider right out there. He does a good, he's been doing, he's been chopping up the tape and putting every one of Wimsett's throws on video uh, without a, anything in between. You're able to see throw for throw how he does. And I think if you just look at the tape, Wimsett is growing a lot, leaps and bounds. He's squeezing the ball into tight windows. He's making decisive, good reads. And he did all of this while behind, on the road, against the number two team in the country, against the hostile crowd of 100 plus thousand. Now, do I love how they sing Mr. Brightside? No, I thought it was very corny, but it's still a crowd of 100,000 and he still looked poised against that uh, that stout defense that Michigan has. Now, Kyle Manungai, 11 carries for 27 yards, 2.5. We were not going to be able to run that ball the way we normally have been running that ball. I don't think it means that we can't run the ball. I don't think it means that this iteration of the Scarlet Knights are pretenders and they're not going to be able to run on other teams. I don't think it means any of those things. I think Michigan's just that good, especially up front, and it was going to be a challenge no matter what. But Michigan had some secondary players back on its vaunted defense, and Wimsett was still able to move the ball a little bit. Now, I know you're going to say, what are you talking about, Larry? He only threw for 180 yards and one touchdown. Well, guess what? They didn't throw the ball that much. They still tried to run it a little bit earlier in the game, and then our opportunities were limited, and we did throw the ball. He looked pretty good, I have to say. Not phenomenal. Not at the pinnacle of where you need him to be if you truly want to get where we want to go. But he looks like he's showing legitimate improvement and legitimately looks, as I've said in the past, you guys who have followed me, you guys who have watched this channel and kept up with my analysis, I have said he is progressing. And he's progressing right before our eyes. And he's, he's progressing in leaps and bounds, to be quite honest with you. Who knows where he'll be the end of 2023, let alone 24 and 25. Um, but look, Manungai was going to struggle. It is what it is. And, I, you know, here's the thing with the offensive line. I noticed we were rotating again. 
And we even had Ireland Brown in there at center, who I thought Zelinskis had really locked that position down. Um, and we had a penalty there from Brown. Not sure why, and a lot of people are out there speculating as why we're rotating. If you remember, Shiano, when he first came back, said he likes rotating offensive linemen because he gets them playing time and guys want to play, and it was a whole new philosophy. But then all of a sudden, the beginning of this year and in training camp and in the spring, he said he'd love to settle on five guys. The way to do it is five guys. Kirk Shiraka seems like a traditional OC. I would think he wants to settle on five guys. So I don't know what the rotations are about. I don't know if it's out of necessity. I don't know if they're shifting because Michigan is so relentless and so good uh, that we didn't want to be worn down. We wanted to get guys rest. I don't know, but I don't know that it boded well. However, I will say, compared to the offensive line performance previous years and understanding how good Michigan's front is supposed to be, I didn't think it was a terrible day for the offensive line in pass blocking. And if they could keep Gavin clean against certain other teams, I think we we may have a chance to do some damage. But what the coaching staff has to do, in my opinion, is it has to understand when the run game's being stifled and when we have to go to the air and you've got to trust the young kid and let him let it fly. And he may make mistakes. But to be quite frank with you, I thought he was going to make more mistakes. To be quite frank with you, I thought he'd be less accurate and I thought he'd have more problems not because I think less of the kid, but because he was in Michigan against a very good defense. But that wasn't the case. So he surprised even me. Um, so I think you got to let him let it fly here and there. I really do. Uh, because teams, especially teams that are more limited than Michigan, that are in more of a dogfight with us, they're going to want to try their best to sell out to stop the run. And if that happens and Gavin makes some plays, we can be a threatening team. Um, Kyle Manungai, though, 11 of, of for 27, as I said. A rough day on the ground. Aaron Young got in there, ran twice for 17 yards, and he was running at 8.5 yards a clip. I know it's only a small sample size, but I really liked seeing Young out there. I thought he brought a different energy. I think he brings a little bit of a different running style. I'm excited to have Young back uh, to get into the lineup, and I'm hoping that that will make a difference in our running game as well. Sam Brown, three carries for 12 yards. That's four yards a carry. Not bad at all. Sam hasn't looked, ex- you know, quite the same, and I don't know if that's because of load management. We're not, you know, getting him into a groove. We're not forcing him. I don't know if he's a little bit ginger on his on his previous injury. I don't know if he's just got to get back into game shape. Um, but we have yet to see him the way he was last year. I also think part of that is that Kyle Manungai has earned that starting role, has earned that bell cow back status, and they're going to feed him until you know they think they can't feed him anymore. Uh, but just a rough day on the ground overall. Again, you know, you got a guy like Dremel, and he's doing damage. I, I keep saying it. I don't know if it's because I'm an Essex County guy, and so is Manungai. I, but I'd like to see Salam. Uh, get a little more run, not saying necessarily hand the ball off to him. You got too many mouths to feed. It is what it is. You know, the coaches see things in practice we don't see. But I think his skill set would lend itself, you know, to some of these passes out in the open, getting him in space. The way we saw Dremel take it to the house, I think sometimes you could see Salam take it to the house. No run for him. Uh, I know he's been passing the depth chart, but I'd love to see him get some run. But it is what it is. I mean, this was Michigan. I didn't predict a win. I didn't expect a win. I think most of us did not expect a win. And I think many of us, when you're you're not really dissecting the stat line per se or the score necessarily, but you're, you know, just judging by the eye test, I think Rutgers has shown us quite a bit. And I think that we should all have some confidence going into the, you know, stretch of our schedule that's going to be challenging that we can find enough wins to get us to to a bowl game and if we can do that especially at this young stage of our quarterback's development and especially as our depth and some of our biggest playmakers are still just coming of age and many of them are still underclassmen or at least only juniors I think that bodes well for the trajectory of the program which is what I've been saying all season so far let's see how it turns out but as of right now you gotta like a lot of the trajectory that's happening at Rutgers I do anyway. Um, So Dremel, three receptions for 85 yards uh, and a touchdown. Jackson, three receptions for 37 yards. 
Uh, Washington, two receptions, 26. Ian Strong, one reception for 18. Johnny Langan, two for 14. Look, it just shows you Wimsett was spreading the ball out there. He was spreading the ball around, and I thought it was a nice showing. Um, one thing I do think, and I understand, and I'm in the minority on this, judging by everything I've heard from from other content creators, other uh, writers of Rutgers Sports, other podcasters in Rutgers Sports, uh, I keep hearing that the right decision was to go for it on fourth down because you got to try to win. Why would you kick a field goal to be down, you know, 17-10? Or why would you kick a field goal early in the game to go up 10-7? to um, And he- here's what I'd say to you. Um, if we want to say we belong on the field with the big boys and we want to play with the big boys and we truly believe that we're reaching that point where we belong on the field with them, then let's play the big boys like big boys. You know, I didn't see the need to go for it on either of those fourth downs. I thought we looked like we could move the ball. Not that we couldn't move the ball all game, I understand. But in those particular instances, we had gotten into Michigan territory without anything that was necessarily fluky. And we have a kicker who seems like he's up for the job and he can he can take on the task. And I'd like to see his leg get some get some work. Now, the first fourth down, we decide to go for it and we get a penalty. And now you back the kid up to a 51 yarder on the road in a hostile environment. And it wasn't the worst kick, but he misses it. I think if you just line the kid up from jump at 40 something yards and you let him just kick it. And then you do the same thing, you know, on the next drive. Maybe it's 17-13, and it's a dogfight to the end. You don't know what's going to happen on the next drive. Yeah, our defense was was really struggling, really struggling to contain. Um, but you don't know that. The score was close enough. I didn't think we needed to empty the tank as if we were, you know, that much of a subpar opponent who needed to just go all out and empty the whole chamber to compete. I thought we could kick the field goals and play some defense. The game had not been so one-sided up to that point that we weren't able to do that. So I disagree with that. Now, Monday morning quarterbacks, everything. I don't get paid millions of dollars to coach Rutgers football. Greg Schiano does. Kirk Shiraka gets paid to call the plays. I don't pretend to be some kind of ridiculous expert, but that's just my take on it. I, I disagree. I think we should have kicked the field goal twice there at the at the onset of the play and seen what happened. Um, and that's that's just me. And then I hated the play call on the fourth and two. But again, I love most of what Chirac has done all year. I'm not gonna you know cry about it. Plus, I expected to lose this game anyway. So you know it is what it is. Some of the the. I just want to briefly touch on it, and I did before. Some of the officiating, I know Shiano said, you know, he kind of hinted at he might have a grievance. I mean, look, the the holding call that really changed the complexion of the game early on, I I hated it. No excuse for that. Picking up a flag for for unsportsmanlike, I don't understand that. He pushes, the defender pushes our guy in the back, and there's a flag thrown after the play. What, the other refs say it's not that big of a deal, pick up your flag? I mean, it's not really a judgment call where you can say, I think he tugged his jersey or I think he had his hands on him and somebody comes and says, well, he didn't really change his trajectory. He didn't really hold him up, so it's not, you know, pass interference. Or I thought he had a guy in the back and somebody else is like, no, I had a better view. He had his front shoulder. I mean, it's not anything like that. I mean, how can you pick up a personal foul flag, like a unsportsmanlike flag? You thought it was unsportsmanlike when you saw it. It was a dead ball penalty. How are you going to come over and say, no, no, just pick it up? Didn't Hated that, actually. And that would have changed the complexion of that most serious drive in the game when you look at how pivotal it was. Um, but look, we were going to lose the game anyway. I'm not blaming it on the refs. Our defense struggled. And I think, you know, Jennings has had a good year for us and had a good year last year. I think he'll continue to have a good year. But he was definitely beaten a couple times out there. Uh, Shaquan Loyal, I'm a big fan of Loyal. He's been a, a ball hawk in some instances. He's literally won games for us. Um, and I think he's a, a hard-nosed safety, and I like his game a lot. But, you know, I don't know what the assignments were. I don't know what was going on. But it seemed like on a few plays he missed contain. Um, and then, look, Max Melton. 
I was saying during the game, Max was in position on that touchdown. And had Max turned his head around and gotten in the way of that ball or stuck his hand out there, he might have stopped the touchdown. And there was another play where he was crossing the field and he was just, he just got beat. He just got beat. And I think there's been a few times this year where Max has gotten beat. And look, corners get beat, okay? Not everybody's perfect. You're not going to have a 100% average in coverage in any level of any football against any team. But, you know, it seems like when the ball goes longer beams way and he gets a smack or he knocks the ball out or they don't even go longer beams way. I'm just saying that, you know, a lot of the preseason hype and the speculation has been that our strongest corner and the strongest cog in the secondary, maybe, you know, excluding Dixon, is Max Melton. But I think Max Melton, you know, while definitely a good player, a starting caliber player in the Big Ten, I think Max has struggled a little bit, you know, since last year. And I think going forward, we should watch, you know, how we cover and we should watch what other teams try to do to Max because over the last couple of weeks, I've seen some things in there that, you know, could be exploited. I don't know if, you know, I'm sure the coaches will break down the film with him, discuss it with him, and try to get him, you know, to the level we know he's capable of playing at. But up to this point, I think Robert Longerbeam has been the stronger of the two corners. I really do. Um, so our defense had a rough day, and that's to be expected. The defense is going to have a rough day against a team like that. Uh, like I said, the quarterback did what he did. I didn't think it was, you know, I didn't think McCarthy set the world on fire. Um, you know, rushing, you did have Corum, man, and Corum is a beast. 21 carries for 97 yards, 4.6 a carry, two touchdowns. Uh we, we struggled with him, too. But part of the way, you know, part of the thing I, what I saw was, and this was encouraging to me, to be honest with you. I saw two teams on the field, and I saw a team in Michigan that was the better team talent-wise. But I didn't see a game where I felt the young men on our team were just overmatched physically or from a talent standpoint to the point that they had no chance and didn't belong on the field. I didn't feel like that at all. I felt like our guys belonged on that field with the Michigan players. Now, were some of the Michigan players more seasoned, um, maybe a bit better in some aspects? Yes. But I also think that some of the reason we lost was strategic, was execution, and not from a physical standpoint. Um, Michigan executed the option very well, whether it was you know the quarterback – running it out, whether it was quorum. Uh, they held their assignments. They broke at the right time. They hit the right holes. And they had the right play calls at the right times. And I don't know that we always did. And But the reason I'm encouraged by that is that can be fixed. That wasn't just such an immense talent gap that you're you know irredeemable and you'll never compete. That, that can be fixed. And it will be fixed, I believe, uh, as the coaches learn the players and personnel better and as the players mature and, and have seen more things and get crisper in their execution. I thought that was a big part of it, but I, I think it's encouraging. So now this week we have Wagner coming up, and I, 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 I've said it last week, but I absolutely love how this schedule uh, broke down for us. I, think it, I, think, I really think this schedule is advantageous this year. I know we have a lot of hard teams in the schedule. That's not going to change. But the way this thing set up, I think, is really a great opportunity for this team this year. You open with a conference game against Northwestern, but it's a winnable conference game. You get 1-0 and in the conference out of the way, and you don't have to play a cupcake team earlier in the year. Um, then, you, you know, you got Temple, who wants to play us tough. They're a regional rival. Barely snuck out of there last year. They present whatever problems they're going to present, especially, you know, with defending the pass. Uh, put some pressure on our secondary. And, you know, we come out of that feeling good, learning about ourselves. Then you play a Virginia Tech team who, yes, they're on a low swing this year. I think coming into the season, some of the way people said that was our toughest test, this and that. I don't know how accurate that's going to be uh, when all is said and done. But they present enough problems and enough uh, determination and competition that we learn more about ourselves. And, again, we have now three wins. We're 3-0 and without having played uh, a team like our Wagner game. 
But before we play Wagner, we get to go on the road, and we're playing one of the toughest opponents we're going to play all year in a hostile environment uh, against very good coaches and very good players. And, you know, now we get to come home and play Wagner. And on a few levels, that's great. Number one, after getting beat straight up decisively by a good Michigan team, you have the opportunity to reinstall some confidence, to not go on a slide, to, to you know, and I'm not going to see all these people saying, oh, it's a glorified bye week, we're going to rest. I mean, that's disrespectful. I, I don't agree with that at all. The Wagner kids are going to are playing football. The Wagner coaches are coaching football, and they're coming and playing to win. And it's happened before, okay? They're coming in there to play football and to knock us in the mouth and to play. This isn't a practice. This isn't an exhibition. This isn't a glorified scrimmage. Now, everybody knows that we should win the game. I predicted us to win the game. I expect us to win the game. Um, and I, But I, I'm not going to call it a bye week. What it is, though, is a great opportunity to get back on track, to clean up some things that you didn't like in the Michigan game, to recalibrate and reinstill some, some solidified confidence, and to rebolster yourself to head into the rest of the Big Ten schedule. What it also does is two other things. Number one, you're going to be hopefully, and everything goes as planned, four and one heading into the rest of the schedule. Four wins already heading into the rest of the schedule. That means you only need to find two more wins to go bowling. And for this program, that's huge. Two more wins is all you got to find. And I'll talk about it, you know, later, but I think we will find two wins. And I think we're going to find two wins against Michigan State and Indiana. I said that at the beginning of the season. I stick to it now. And now you're seeing teams like Iowa look a little more vulnerable, not only because they don't look as crisp, but because we look better than expected. Now, I'm not getting hyped up. I'm not jumping up and down. I'm not, you know, projecting us to do anything crazy. But this is still as expected, and I think it's even more of a realistic possibility now that we're watching this season. I think a lot of the four-win and even some of the five-win predictions are looking like a little bit, hmm, maybe we can get to six or seven wins. I'm not going over the top because every Saturday is different and every matchup is different. So don't quote me as being over-optimistic or silly, but I do think there's wins there for us. But the final thing that this schedule did for us, in my opinion, is going into Michigan and getting popped in the mouth couldn't have come at a more opportune time. And this is why I say that. You start off with a Big Ten opponent, but one that's not very good. You play your ACC opponent right before going to Michigan. You have your you know non-Power 5 opponent, but regional rival um, and still FBS team in, in Temple. And you're getting confident. And maybe sometimes you get a little cocky. I'm not saying these kids will. They chop the moment. I understand that. But just hypothetically, human beings, you know, whatever. You get a little confident. The headlines start coming out. People start getting confident. People's hopes start getting up. The more you win, the higher the hopes. Even though every year we're playing, you know, Wagner or whoever we're playing. And we hang up 60 points, 50-something points. And everybody knows we're supposed to. You still get some people, well, we can run. We can pass. We get People get way too hyped. So you see how we stack up against Michigan. And you get punched in the mouth. I think for the team and for the fans and for everybody, the energy around the program, it's good to get popped in the mouth right there. It's not... Later in the season where you really need a win, you're on a skid, you've had some tough, close games, and then you get popped in the mouth, and maybe you're going to get pushed off the edge. It's not after you're flying way too high. It's right when you're getting a little high and confident, but it's a good gut check. It's a good gut check. It's over with. We came out mostly healthy from the game. And now you've got Wagner where you can get some confidence, reinstill it but it'll never get too high because you saw where you stacked up against Michigan but you're confident enough based on how you tough you played Michigan based on how well you did in your first three games and based on how you're going to do against Wagner that you're ready to go into the rest of this Big Ten schedule and I actually think they're going to go into this Big Ten schedule now prepared it's like if you got shocked once punched once fell once whatever it was any spicy pepper one now you're bracing yourself to get punched that hard again. And I don't know that another team 
until Penn State, maybe Ohio State. I don't know if another team's going to punch us as hard as Michigan did straight up in the trenches. So maybe they go in with more confidence, healthy, but ready to absorb that crazy punch Michigan gave. Maybe we overcompensate and actually play a team not as good as Michigan much harder and give ourselves a chance to win. Maybe it was Wisconsin, although I'm still not a believer that we can go into Wisconsin and win. I'm just not. Uh, that's just so much depth, so much tradition, traditionally big and deep. I just think it's still tough for us in the trenches up against a team like Wisconsin, but it still doesn't negate the point I just made when we play them. And then against teams like Michigan State, against teams like Indiana, I mean, we should be ready. This is conference time. We know what we can do. We know where we stack up with the upper echelon. We got to be at our best. Let's go out there. And that's for the players and the coaches. The coaches know what works, what doesn't work, who's poised, who's not. We could all use all that to our advantage. So this week, it's a 3.30 kickoff. Supposed to be. We'll see. It's been nothing but rain, but I'm looking out my window right now, and I'm seeing it clear up a little bit. Supposed to be maybe another nice fall day. And if that's the case, then it makes up for the rain with Temple. We got blessed then with the uh, kickoff against Virginia Tech, 330. Beautiful fall weather. And if we can pull off another 330, beautiful fall weather kickoff against Wagner on Saturday, it's going to be great. Come out to the game. Enjoy the tailgate. Enjoy the game. And and hunker down and buckle up and get ready for this Big Ten schedule. Uh, But I'm excited about it. And, you know, giving and taking what we saw in the Michigan game, a game I did not predict us nor think we were going to win per se. Anyway, I'm encouraged about the rest of the season. That's not just because of the Michigan play. It's because of the other three games as well. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, guys, if you haven't done so yet, and, and every, so many people have, and we're getting so close to our goal, we're going to hit 300. And you could help us hit 300 subscribers this week. By kickoff at Wagner, I want to be broadcasting to you live from the blue lot. And I will. If we reach 300 subscribers by Saturday, I will broadcast to you live from the blue lot on Saturday. And I will show you the tailgate and everything else. Assuming the Wi-Fi works out there, the data works. Because it's been struggling a little. But if you can get this channel to 300 subscribers, I will broadcast live from the blue lot on Saturday. And do a thank you to everybody. We are only four subscribers away. If you haven't done so yet, it takes a second just hit that subscribe button hit it right now just just go down click it just click it do me a favor just just click that subscribe button especially if you like Rutgers content especially if you like good college football content big 10 content uh I'll talk to you guys again soon we still got a ton of basketball stuff to dive into we got more football stuff to dive into post Wagner I'll talk to you if we get 300 I'll talk to you pre Wagner and uh join the family join Nightwatch. But until then, go Knights and Larry K out.